History is not the study of the past. History is the study of change, of how things change, how society, economics, politics, how they change. And of course, we can't predict the future. Historians can't do that. I don't think anybody can predict the future. But if you understand the processes of change in the past, it can give you at least some insight about what might happen in the future. Hallo und herzlich willkommen zu einer neuen Ausgabe von Handelsblatt Disrupt, dem Podcast über neue Ideen, Disruption und die Zukunft der digitalen Welt. Mein Name ist Sebastian Mattes und ich begrüße Sie wie immer ganz herzlich aus unserem Podcast-Studio hier in Düsseldorf. Diese Woche haben wir hier bei Handelsblatt Disrupt ein richtiges Highlight zu bieten. Auf dem Gigagipfel einer sehr besonderen Tech-Konferenz des Handelsblatts in Sölden auf 3048 Metern Höhe habe ich mit dem Historiker Yuval Noah Harari gesprochen. Wie hier in der Runde sicher viele wissen, Harari ist einer der bekanntesten Public Intellectuals der Welt. Er hat mehrere Weltbestseller geschrieben, seine Bücher wurden in 65 Sprachen übersetzt und 35 Millionen Mal verkauft. Und das liegt vielleicht auch daran, dass Harari sich als Historiker nicht nur Gedanken über die Vergangenheit macht, sondern immer wieder auch über die Zukunft. Ich habe mit ihm über die Fragen gesprochen, wie sich die Welt durch die Pandemie verändert hat, mit welchen Bedrohungen die Menschheit in den nächsten Jahrzehnten konfrontiert sein wird und warum das Gebaren der Tech-Konzerne niemandem egal sein darf. In unserem Gespräch ging es aber auch um die Frage, ob wir nun vor einer dystopischen Dekade stehen mit immer stärkerem Klimawandel und globalen Konflikten oder goldenen Zwanzigern mit Wachstum, Fortschritt und letztlich Aufbruchsstimmung. Und wir haben über seine Meditationspraxis diskutiert und so viel sei hier verraten, Harari meditiert jeden Tag ungefähr zwei Stunden lang und das, so sagt er, habe seinen Blick auf ihn selbst, aber auch auf die Welt verändert. Und damit direkt nach Sölden zu meinem Gespräch mit Yuval Noah Harari. Yuval, welcome. Great to have you here today. It's good to be here. Thank you for inviting me. So you are a, a popular guest on many conferences these days. You are in television and radio. I've seen you in, or heard you in many podcasts. And you, is, you have also discussed your views with Angela Merkel, with Emmanuel Macron. And um, all because... Obviously, because you are this well-known public intellectual, but also because you have written books about the past, but also about the future. Um, but actually, you are a historian and yeah. um, you teach history. So I was wondering, when and why did you start to think about the future? Well, first, I think that history is not the study of the past. History is the study of change of how things change, how society, economics, politics, how they change. Mm. And of course, we can't predict the future. Historians can't do that. I don't think anybody can predict the future. But if you understand the processes of change in the past, it can give you at least some insight about what might happen in the future. And uh, even though you can't tell exactly how the world would look like in 10 or 20 years, we can at least draw maps of different possibilities, of different scenarios, which can be helpful because most people, they tend to think in, line in a linear way that whatever happened in the last 10 or 20 years will simply continue along the same trajectory. And this never happens in history. There are always surprises. There are always unexpected turns. So um, let's stick with that for a second. What is your cause, what is the mission you are on beside being this well-known public intellectual and this somehow profit guru you are today? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I, I, I try to focus the public conversation, the global conversation on the most important challenges that face humankind. We are flooded by enormous amounts of information and distractions and it's hard to, uh, to focus. And um, I, I see my job as serving as some kind of bridge between the scientific community and the general public, helping to focus the global conversation on the most important issues, uh, which I think are the threat of global war, the threat of ecological collapse, and the threat of disruptive technologies like artificial intelligence. Uh, everything else, you know, issues about 
um, immigration and terrorism and whatever, it's important. I'm not dismissing it completely, but it pales into insignificance besides these three major challenges. Mm. We have to talk about some of these threats definitely today, but I would like to start with one of your big themes um, you, you are stressing pretty often. And th that is, unlike in the past, we as societies somehow have lost the story. We don't have a mm. narrative to tell anymore. So what, what is the current story we are listening to? Um, we don't have... A, a single unifying story that explains to us what is happening in the world. And this is why it's difficult to know what to focus on. So I think that um, the story we need for the 21st century is first of all global and secondly biological. You can't understand the world if you just adopt a narrow perspective of a single country, a single religion, a single culture. Maybe it worked in the past, even this is arguable, but maybe it worked in the past. It's no longer working now. And secondly, that to really understand what is happening, you need to take a more biological perspective of human beings. And we've all been reminded of the fact that we are animals over the last two years with the pandemic But it's also true with regard to the other major issues, whether it's the threat to the ecological basis for humanity or whether it's the way that new technologies are able to hack the human organism and to start manipulating it and change uh, our bodies and brains in ways that uh, previously were impossible. I mean, you know, for most of history, humans could think of themselves, often thought of themselves as being separate from the rest of the natural world as, we've, as if we aren't animals, we aren't subject to the same rules and laws as the other organisms. But in the 21st century, this is no longer tenable. We have to accept our place in, uh, in nature as not just as animals, but now for the first time as hackable animals. Uh, entities that are as, as complex as we are we now for the first time have the technology to actually decipher what is happening inside the body, inside the brain. So an external system for the first time in history is able to understand me better than I understand myself and therefore potentially manipulate me and control mm. me in unprecedented ways. We, we will talk about hackable humans definitely today, but, but again, um, how could um, a narrative for the future look like and who could find such a new story for societies? I mean, populists all mm. over the world are trying to. They try to tell a story from the past to make something great again, whatever. But who Yeah, you know, I mean, the, the populists, the, what, what they have to offer is nostalgic fantasies about the past. And uh, let's go back to some glorious past. And as a historian, I can tell you two things. I mean, there are many things I don't know about the future and about also the past, but there are two things as the historians I do know about the past. First of all, it's not coming back. There is absolutely no way to recreate the conditions of the 1950s or of the Middle Ages. And secondly, even if it was possible, you wouldn't like to do it. The past wasn't fun. It wasn't fun to live in most periods in history. If I had to choose uh, where and when to be born as a human being in history, I don't think I could improve on, say, Germany in the early 21st century. So you think um, the, the current time is the best? Um, for humans, yes. For the rest of the ecological... If I'm an animal, definitely not. <laughs> But if I'm a human being, then yes. I mean, so far, it's been the... Like, the last 20 years have been the best time ever. There are still many problems. I mean, you have to differentiate between two things. Between saying things are better than ever and saying that things are good. No, there are still many problems. Many things are bad, but it is still better than ever. And appreciating this is not something that should make us smug and complacent. Hey, we've, we've, we've done it, no need to, 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 to do anything else. No, it's just the opposite. When you realize that things have really improved over the last century or so, it should make us more responsible because it means that, the, 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 that it's our decisions that determine the level of violence in the world or the level of inequality. Um, if you think that say, if you take violence as an example, if you think that the level of violence today 
is as bad as it ever was, it probably means that there is a law of nature, the law of the preservation of violence or something, that no matter what humans try to do, it doesn't work. Violence remains the same. And if so, there is no point in trying to, to do anything, anything ourselves. I mean, if no previous generation has managed to do something, what's so special about us that we'll be able to do it? Mm. But if you realize that no, actually many of the initiatives of the ideas of the actions of previous generations reduced the level of violence to its lowest level ever, this means that we have a huge responsibility to, first of all, preserve the achievements of previous generations, and secondly, to improve them. Uh, we can do it because they have succeeded in doing it. I would like to talk a little bit about this one issue that has determined uh, public debate over the last year and a half or so, um, mm -hmm. the pandemic and how it has uh, changed the world. What do you think, yeah. how, how will this historic event will be seen in a couple of decades? Is this the beginning of another, let's say, roaring 20s with um, innovation and mm. growth, as some say, or will it be um, somehow a um, really dystopian decade of unstoppable climate change mm. and um, uh, negative effects of aging populations, as others say? What do you think? I think it totally depends on our own decisions. History is not deterministic. History is shaped by the decisions of individuals, of governments, of corporations. So it's up to us. If we react to the present crisis by generating hatred, blaming the epidemic on foreigners and minorities, refusing to cooperate with other countries and things like that, then it will create a disunited world full of tensions, full of violence, and things will deteriorate. And we won't be able, for example, to deal with even bigger th global threats like climate change. On the other hand, you can draw the opposite conclusions that the, the, the best reaction to the pandemic is not blaming others and uh, are focusing only on ourselves, but actually cooperating with other countries because we can't solve this kind of crisis on a national level. Even if you vaccinate all the people in your country, as long as the virus continues to spread in other countries, it might mutate, it will mutate, and a new mutation might overcome the vaccine and be even worse than the, the previous ones. So we need a global plan of action. And if we are able to cooperate on, on this crisis, this builds a foundation for a more harmonious world, which can then tackle bigger challenges like climate change. And yes, the next decade is crucial, especially if you think about uh, the fast deteriorating situation on, of, on, on climate. But it's not too late uh, uh, to take action. I think that too many people have switched from a kind of um, ignorance or even denial of mm -hmm. the ecological crisis to a kind of uh, 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 doomsday mood that it's too late. Uh, everything is, is, is ruined and there is nothing to do about it. And we need to stop in the middle to acknowledge both the magnitude of the threat, but also the immense power that we have now as humanity to stop it. At, according to the best experts that I know, then the key number to remember is 2%. 2% of global annual GDP. If we invest 2% of global annual GDP in developing new eco-friendly technologies and eco-friendly infrastructure, this should be enough to prevent catastrophic climate change. It won't solve all the ecological problems of the world, but it will prevent the worst case scenario. And you know, 2% of global GDP is a lot of money, of course, but it's completely feasible. If there would be a world war, governments would spend much more than 2% of GDP on fighting this war. Uh, and and uh, so we, we should be able to do it. And politicians, you know, this is their job, to change priorities and shift 2% of the budget. Mm -hmm. If it was 20%, it would probably be hopeless. It, it's too much. But 2% is completely feasible, especially as it's not like taking this money and burning it. It's investment. It creates jobs, it creates new technologies, it creates a better infrastructure. So I think, again, I, I, it's not a prophecy. I don't know what people will do. I hope they choose wisely the path of cooperation and responsibility 
in which case, um, I don't think that we are doomed to some uh, uh, terrible decade of pandemics and, and climate crisis and things like that. It can actually be a very hopeful and positive decade. There's a lot of hope, definitely. But also you mentioned the cooperation of uh, nations that is crucial to fight climate crisis. And when we look back to the pandemic, didn't we learn that uh, especially the cooperation between states didn't really work? There has been a lot of cooperation between scientists, as we've heard here mm -hmm. today already and we've seen. Yeah. But isn't that the crucial point? And why are you so optimistic that this will mm. happen with this much bigger topic um, uh, just now? Oh, I, I'm not op optimistic. I, I'm saying that we should do this. Right. I don't say that we actually will do it. Uh, human stupidity is one of the most powerful forces in history. Um, and, it's, and, it, and it's still at large. And you're absolutely right. When I look at the last two years, so um, it's been scientific triumph coupled with political disaster. I mean, the scientists have cooperated more or less uh, globally to identify the virus, to understand how it spreads, how it can be stopped, to develop vaccines. Like the vaccine that protects me and my family and my neighbors was not developed by Israeli scientists. It was developed by scientists in Germany. Um, so um, on, on this level of science, of science, there has been amazing cooperation and an amazing success. Never have humans been so powerful when faced by a pandemic. But then you look at the political level, and it's, it's really disheartening, disheartening to see the, the lack of cooperation, the lack of responsibility. It's been almost two years since the beginning of the crisis. We still don't have a global plan of action of how to protect uh, the whole of humankind from this pandemic and how to deal with the economic uh, consequences and, and so forth. So yeah, I know I sounded a bit optimistic earlier, but it, it was just you know, aspirational that we can still do it. <laughs> When I look at the actual facts of the last two years, then, then yes, I, I'm not very optimistic. If we couldn't cooperate in the face of this obvious threat of the virus, then things are not looking very good. When, when we think about climate change and other issues. I mean, behind that stands the question whether uh, humans um, are really able to secure their own survival, right? What can we learn about this from the past? Um, well, th th there are several different lessons. I mean, on the one hand, we are more powerful than in any previous time in history. If you compare the COVID pandemic to previous ones, like the 1918 influenza or the... Then... Back then, people didn't understand what was causing the disease and how to stop it. Now we have the tools necessary, so uh, we are much more secure in this sense. On the other hand, the very tools we have developed that give us power now are also the source of a new kind of threat to our survival, whether it's a physical threat like climate change, which is caused by our inventions, and our industry and our technology, or it's the even more complicated threat posed by uh, disruptive technologies, mm. like artificial intelligence or, or, or biotechnology. It's a completely new kind of threat that humans never had to face in the past. Um, you know, these new technologies, they don't just threaten the physical survival of humanity, they threaten the very meaning of humanity. Throughout history, You know, people could use social engineering to try and change humanity, but this was very limited, what you can do with social engineering. Now you have, uh, 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 like, the biological engineering is opening, and you can even envis envisage the, the engineering of completely non-organic beings for the first time in the history of life on Earth, Mm. And we don't know what to do with these immense powers of creation and destruction. In a way, you know, we are almost like gods. We now have the power to create life. We are, we, we've went even further than, say, the God of the Old Testament, who managed only to create organic beings. Like he supposedly created the, you know, the, the giraffes and the jellyfish and the bananas and the, and the, and the, and the humans. But now we can not just re-engineer all these organic beings, 
We are on the verge of creating something that never existed before, which is non-organic beings. And we don't know what to do with these immense powers. If we make bad decisions, it will not just jeopardize the future of humanity, but the future of the whole of life. So that's a very uh, huge responsibility. And eh, as, as I look around, I'm, I don't see the kind of, of global cooperation around these issues that, that, uh, that, that we need. So um, political leaders are meeting in Glasgow uh, next week. Um, there will be the big debates about the future, about the climate crisis. Do you think anything will come out of it? I don't know. I'm not a political commentator, so I, 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 I'm not familiar with the specific political pressures that uh, the different uh, uh, head of, heads of state and governments are working under. As I said, I'm, the most important thing to realize is that it's not too late. We have the power, we have the technology, we have the economic capacity to turn this thing around. Yes, but whether we have the political will, right. that depends on not just on the leaders, but also on, on the citizens. Mm. What are their priorities? Yeah. Um, and, and, and here, you know, part of what I do is exactly to try and change the public conversation so people realize that uh, the, the, the immense danger that everybody faces. And you know, the, usually in history, when there is a huge disaster, the poor suffer much more than the rich. Whatever happens, the rich somehow manage to find a way to protect themselves. Mm. So even with the climate crisis, it's likely that the rich will be able to construct some kind of technological Noah's Ark that will protect them, and the flood will mainly hurt the, the, the poorer sections of, of society and the poorer countries around the world. So I know that especially now, with all this uh, 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 debate about what to do with, with the climate change, there are people who say we have other priorities. We, first of all, need to take care of the immediate economic and social problems of our country or of the poor people. But I think this is a wrong way of thinking, that um, history doesn't give discounts, that it's, it's really unfair. But the people who already suffer the worst problems now, they will also suffer the worst consequences of the climate change. History won't give them a discount and say, oh, I know that, that you suffered so much already from other things, so I'll, I'll give you a pass on this one. No, it usually happens just the opposite. If you're already poor and if you're already powerless because of other things, when a disaster hits, whether it's a pandemic, whether it's climate change, anything else, you will again suffer the worst consequences. Mm. So let's try a last angle on um, climate crisis. So what has to happen that uh, nations start working together on such a topic? Huh. Um, I, I, I'm not a good politician. <laughs> this no, is why let's I'm, try this from a, a historical angle, because um, in, in, in the past there has been cooperation. So what has to happen? How bad does it have to get, maybe? Hmm. Um, if nations start to really feel the pain of the climate crisis, then they are likely to wake up and realize that something has to be done. The problem with the crisis is that it works differently from previous historical crises. When you really start to feel the pain, it, then it might be too late. Now it's not too late. Uh, but in 10 years or 20 years, it might be too late. And this is, this is what, one of the things that makes this crisis so complicated politically, that um, you don't have the kind of immediate threat that something like Uh, uh, like a war or something like a pandemic, it has, you know, you need to concentrate people's minds. War has the tendency to focus your mind. Oh, they are coming with the tanks and the airplanes. We must do something. Mm. Uh, climate change works differently. Maybe we need here help from artists, from storytellers. You know, if you think about it like a, like a Hollywood blockbuster, people go to see uh, movies like tornado or volcano or the invasion of the giant ants. 
Nobody would go to see a Hollywood movie whose title is uh, Two Degrees Celsius Above Pre-Industrial Levels. <laughs> but it's not, it's not, I mean, we lack the, the, the story. I think one of the things that Greta did and other young activists did, they came up with, this, with a very powerful story. And their story was the old of sacrificing the young on the altar of their ambitions and greed, which links to very old mythological ideas, you know, Abraham and Isaac, Agamemnon and Epigenia, this whole idea of the old sacrificing, su- sacrificing the young. And to, politics is to a large extent not about science and facts because too many people, uh, it's too complicated for them. Politics is often moved by powerful stories. And we need to find these powerful stories that are based, of course, on the scientific knowledge, but are able to kind of change people's minds uh, quickly enough mm. and, and in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a powerful enough way so that they change their political priorities. So there was one topic um, on this conference um, being discussed quite a bit. Um, it's the question whether um, the climate crisis can be averted due to te- technological innovation or mm-hmm. is um, our only hope to dramatic change um, behavior. What do you think? I, th- I, would, I, I would go for the technological option simply because changing human behavior in a fundamental way takes a lot, a lot, a long time, and we just don't have this time. And I also think that kind of shifting the blame to the behavior of individuals is extremely counterproductive and even dangerous because it, it, it shifts the focus away from the ones who are really responsible, both originally for, for, for making this mess and also for solving it. If you direct the attention towards the actions of individuals in a kind of, kind of trying to uh, cause them to feel guilty that, oh, I, I took an airplane, or I don't, uh, I, I eat this, or I, I did that, it shifts the attention away from the real source of the problem, which is the priorities and decision-making of corporations and governments. Mm. So yes, as far as possible, individuals should change their behavior, but the onus should not be on them. We should not enter this kind of of, of guilt game that trying to make individuals guilty for, uh, for their daily behavior. We don't have time for this. We want to focus the attention on the governments and on the corporations. It's on you to, uh, to, to change priorities in the budgets, to change regulations, to change business models. It won't come from individuals changing their transportation uh, uh, preferences or, or diet. It, it's, it's too late for that. Mm. We've talked a lot about how the pandemic has changed the world somehow. How did uh, the pandemic change your world, your everyday life? Or did it at all? Well, you know, I, I'm, I'm not here, I'm not with you physically. I'm with you kind of spiritually via this Zoom thing. Um, yeah, I guess the two years ago, the organizer of the conference would have told me, hey, you want to be, you, you want to participate, you must come in person. Well, I mean, the idea that you can sit in Tel Aviv in your office and mm-hmm. join uh, online, it was technically possible, but it was socially not very acceptable. Now, after these two years of pandemic, and I think this will stay with us that we realized, hey, there are many things that we can do differently and they are not necessarily uh, all bad. And um, yeah, some things certainly need the intimate proximity of people. And I also think that the, 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 the uh, pandemic and social distancing made us realize how important these things are. But we have more judgment about what can be done online from a distance and what really justifies and merits the expense of time and, and money and so forth of, you say, traveling uh, to, to, to another country. We would have definitely loved to have you here, but um, that's true. Millions <laughs> have uh, moved their, life, uh, their lives online. It's more convenient. But uh, the same is true um, also for surveillance. So mm. how will this uh, beginning age of surveillance shape the society? 
This is very frightening. It's one of the biggest dangers in the world, and it really increased during the last two years. What people should realize is that for the first time in history, it's technically possible to survey everybody all the time and to get to know people better than they know themselves. Now, this was always the dream of every tyrant and every dictator in history. If you think about Stalin or if you think about the Stasi in East Germany, they wanted to do it. They wanted to follow everybody all the time. But it was technically impossible. You don't have enough Stasi agents to follow each and every citizen uh, 24 hours a day. They did have this trick of, okay, we'll get half the population to follow the other half. So the husband would spy on his wife and the wife would spy on her husband. But even that, it wasn't, it wasn't really effective because... In the end of the day, if I spy on my husband, so, you know, I write a paper report and send it to Stasi headquarters, and there some human being needs to read all these paper reports, a mountain of paper, and uh, find patterns and reach conclusions, and it's impossible. Mm. Now, you don't need human agents to follow everybody around. We have microphones, we have cameras, we have our own personal Stasi agent in, in the pocket, the smartphone, which we paid for, which follows us more kind of, more uh, 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 all, every minute. And all the information it gathers, it's not paper reports that somebody needs to read. It's electronic data that new machine learning, new AI algorithms can analyze much better, much faster than any human being. So for the first time in history, it's technically possible to follow everybody all the time. And not only what we do and what we say and who we meet, it's now becoming feasible to go under our skin. You know, surveillance throughout history, it was above the skin. The, the Stasi agent could see where you go, who you meet. But what you actually feel, that was much more difficult. If you watch a speech by the leader, on, you listen to a speech of the leader on the radio, they can watch you and you, they see you smile and they see that you clap your hands, but they don't know maybe inside you actually hate this person. You actually feel angry about what they say. They don't know. Mm. Now with the new age of surveillance, it's possible to go under the skin and using biometric signals, uh, starting with facial expression and body language, but going all the way to blood pressure and heart rate and brain activity, we are very close to the point that you can really uh, monitor my thoughts, my feelings, and, and know what I feel every moment and do it to the entire population. And this is... We've never been in this situation before in history. Now, it's not all bad. You can do wonderful things with this kind of surveillance power, for instance, to create the best healthcare system in history. If there is a healthcare system that monitors me 24 hours a day, including what's happening inside my body, it can diagnose diseases, whether it's cancer or whether it's the flu, uh, when they are just starting and it's very easy and cheap to, to deal with them and to protect others from infection. But they can also be the basis for the worst totalitarian regime in human history, something far worse than anything we've seen in the 20th century. And um, again, it's not a prophecy. We see some countries moving in that direction, but it's to not too late to stop it. We need to regulate this surveillance technology. We need to regulate the new information economy, the flow of data in the world, in order to prevent the kind of dystopian totalitarian scenarios. It's always easy to ask for regulation, but how could that actually look like? And it's not... We are oh, not I, I can give a few examples if, if, if you want. Um, so three very basic rules that should be implemented is, first of all, that um, my data, if anybody is collecting my data, it should be used only to help me, never in order to manipulate me. That should be a very firm principle. And it's, it's an old principle. You know, if you think about my relations with my personal physician, even before this new age of technology, so my physician was privy to a lot of very private and important information about me 
in many, in some cases, my physician knew things about me that I didn't know. And it was fine because my physician didn't sell this information to advertisers or to political parties in order to manipulate me and sell me products I don't need or make me vote for a politician. It should be the same in the new information economy. So that's the first principle. The second principle is that we should never allow all the information to be concentrated in one place, whether it's a government agency or whether it's a corporation. That's the high road to dictatorship. They should always be separate silos, separate systems of information. So, for example, in the time of the pandemic, yes, we need to monitor individuals more than before as a countermeasure to stop the chains of infection, but it should not be done, say, by the police. It should be done by a separate authority which doesn't share the information with anybody else. It's less efficient, but inefficiency is a feature, not a bug. <laughs> a data system which is too efficient is the, again, it's, it's, this is the road to dictatorship. And the third principle is that whenever you increase surveillance of individuals, you must simultaneously increase surveillance of the government and the big corporations. There are times like a pandemic when, I mean, yes, it should be done. We should increase surveillance of individuals in times of the pandemic. But if we do so, we must simultaneously, it should not, not be just up, down, but also down, up. We should, for example, make it easier to monitor the government decisions about the allocation. You know, governments have created basically trillions of euros and dollars, and, and we need easier access as citizens, as individuals, to see where the money goes. And similarly, we need to supervise, to monitor the corporations better. It's not okay that they know everything about me and I know almost nothing about them, <laughs> about their policies, about their tax, the, uh, tax avoidance tricks and things like that. So the technology can go both ways. If at the same time we increase surveillance from uh, up, to, uh, uh, up to, to down, if at, at the same time we increase bottom-up surveillance, it keeps the balance and that means that even in a, 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 a world with new surveillance technology, we can preserve uh, democracy and we can preserve the uh, uh, crucial balance of power between individuals and institutions. And we need this huge debate about who's owning the data in future. Yes, uh, it, it all revolves around this question of who owns the data, which is a very complicated question because the nature of data is different from the nature of previous kinds of property. We have, you know, thousands of years of experience in regulating the ownership of things like real estate, like houses or, or fields. Okay, there is a field, it's mine, I build a fence <laughs> around it, there is a gate, I say who goes in. Very, very simple. But with data, if somebody has my DNA, or somebody has the record of everything I've done online in the last year. I mean, how do I maintain ownership of such a thing? How do we prevent theft? You know, that there are people like uh, Shoshana Zuboff who make a very compelling case that what uh, many of these companies like Facebook have been doing, you don't need a new regulation to prevent it. You need a very old regulation. It's in the Ten Commandments from 3,000 years ago. Thou shall not steal. It, we just need to understand that taking the data of, of individuals and using it without their permission, especially in ways that harm them, this is just theft. And we don't need a new rule. We just need to enforce the old rules. Mm. So you've talked already about how um, AI can become a powerful tool for authoritarian regimes. Following this analysis, um, what's your take on the future of democracies? Will this system prevail? <clears throat> um, I don't know. I do know that democracy is the best system in the world in terms of adapting to new conditions. That's, that's its main advantage. You know, people, especially in the time of the pandemic, they suddenly looked at autocratic regimes 
with admiration, look, they can do things far faster and more efficiently. If you want lockdown on a city, you don't need to have this debate and, and compromises and consensus. You just need one person to give the word and it's done. And it is more efficient. The problem is that if the dictator makes a mistake, it's extremely difficult to expose it and to correct it. This is the, the, the strength of a democracy, that it can try different things, and if something doesn't work, it's easier to admit a mistake and to try a different course of action. It looks chaotic, and therefore, all through the history of democracy, you always find these kinds of comparison. You know, I don't know, look at the 1960s. And people compare the United States with all you know, the riots and assassinations and rising political tensions and the civil rights movement and, 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 and you know, shooting in campuses and all that. And then they look at the Soviet Union and everything is peaceful and quiet and orderly and nobody objects to anything. And 20 years later, it's the Soviet Union that collapses because the, the, the democratic chaos also had its good side. It creates new things it allows more opinions. Now, what happened to democracy in the last 20 or 30 years, uh, uh, and partly as a result of social media and the new technologies, is that many more voices joined the conversation. If you imagine democracy as a kind of table with people sitting around the table and trying to reach some consensus about what to do. So a couple of decades ago, it was mostly I, I don't know, white heterosexual men sitting around the table trying to reach a consensus. And then suddenly more groups joined and they have opinions, they have interests, they have problems which previously were not addressed. So the consensus breaks down and there is, a, 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 there is, there is chaos. There is no agreement. But this is not necessarily a bad thing. It takes time to take into account the new voices, the new opinions, and reach a new kind of, of consensus. And even when you think about th something like artificial intelligence and, and the power that it gives to concentrated power, um, the danger of algorithmic takeover, of algorithms taking over power from humans, it's actually much bigger in a dictatorship than in, the, in democracy. Hmm. Democracy is messy. For an AI to gain authority, it's, it's difficult. In a dictatorship, it's much easier because there already is a single source of power. Just imagine what happens, say, if the Chinese Communist Party decides to give algorithms greater say in the crucial decisions of promotions and appointments within the party apparatus. Mm. Like you have this huge system that follows everybody all the time and especially follows party members because it's, it's usually like that in a dictatorship. The closer you get to the, point, to the top, the more closely you are followed. And, um, so, and based on the data makes decisions who to promote and who to appoint to which position. Very soon, the CCP is actually governed by an algorithm and not by the Politburo on, uh, not by any one individuals. As, and over time, the algorithm, and this is the, the, you know, this is the strength of AI, it changes, it learns, it mm. develops into things that even the people who designed it could not foresee. So it would be much easier for an AI to take over the CCP and China than to take over the United States. Just understanding something like a filibuster could cause the AI to, to, you know, to shut down in despair. But AI is maybe not um, controlling power in, in nation states, um, but it's becoming a powerful tool. So I was wondering, is the, the nation that controls AI or that is the best in AI will somehow control the world? Yes, I think that this, is a, uh, uh, this is a fair prediction. This is the most important technology of the present era. So will at that now, be China? Either, at present, there are just two contenders. It's either China or the US, take mm. your pick. There is no, nobody else in the field 
is even close to them. And this could mean a new kind of Cold War. It could mean a new kind of, a new kind of, of empire uh, and a new kind of colonialism, a, a data colonialism. Imagine a world in which basically all the data of the world flows into just two places, China and the US, where it is stored and analyzed. Mm. Um, if, you know, imagine 20 years from now, when all the data of every politician, every journalist, every CEO, every judge in your country is uh, uh, in the hands of somebody in, New York, in, in, in Washington or Beijing, would you still be an independent country or would you become a data colony? In the 21st century, to control a country, you don't need to send in the soldiers. You just need to take out the data. So is Europe becoming a data colony already? I mean, in your vision, Europe, it sounds like that. Uh, to, to an extent, yes, it's trying to... I mean, I'll, I'll say one more thing about being a data colony. It's not just about politics, it's also about economics. The usual relations between the imperial center and the colonies or the provinces is that the colonies provide raw material and the sophisticated technology is produced in the center and then sent back. Like uh, Egypt sends cotton to Britain in a, a century ago, Britain produces the high-end textiles and send them back to Egypt to sell them. Now, for the, the technology, the key technology is AI, and the raw material is data. To develop AI, at least now, you need huge amounts of data. Mm. So you have data from all over the world, from Egypt, from Brazil, from Indonesia, from Europe, going to basically two places, United States and China, where the most sophisticated technology is developed and then sent back to the colonies, to the provinces. Now, Europe, because of its historical power and economic power, still has a chance of escaping uh, the orbit of these two... Uh, uh, stars and becoming a third uh, center of, of, of power. But so far, it's, it's, it's not happening. If you look at the 10 largest corporations in the relevant fields, none of them is, is European. Mm. Um, but, mm. but there is still a chance for Europe. Mm. Uh, if, if it, you know, it gets its, its act together and first of all manages to, 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 to uh, find, a, a, again, a common European ethos, and a common European uh, mission for the current era, then they still have a chance. And now AI is merging also with biotechnology, as you have um, written in your books. And um, I was wondering in preparation to this talk, whether the biggest difference between the 20th and the 21st century really is that first humans understood how to control nature, and now mm. they somehow understand how to control their inside. Is that what you mean yes. with the superhumans? Yeah, we are learning how to control and change not just the world outside us, the animals, the, the forests, the rivers. We increasingly decipher the body and the brain and our genetic code and learning how to manipulate them and changing in more and more ways. You know, one place that you can see it already happening, and it draws immense attention, public attention, at least in the West, is the debates about transgender people and non-binary people and, and, and so forth. And you, I'm, I sometimes wonder, you know, the world is on fire and people are having these heated debates about who can go into which toilets. If I, uh, if I transitioned from female to male, should I go to the male toilet or to the female toilet? And you have these huge political debates about it. And from one perspective, you think, Uh, uh, did, did people go mad? This is what they have to deal with when the world is on fire? But on the other hand, I think it, people understand maybe subconsciously that this is kind of the front line. This is just the beginning. That as we gain the power to reshape the human body and the human and brain, it starts, you know, turning a male body into a, a female body. That's a huge change. And that's just the beginning. Hmm. So I think it draws so much attention because people understand perhaps implicitly that this is the first kind of battle of the, 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 the front line in what is going to greatly increase in the coming decades 
the question of uh, 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 transhumanism and the question of what can and can't, what should and shouldn't be done with this ability to reshape mm. the human body and the human, and the human brain. Before I would um, like to ask some personal questions, I would um, try one last view into the future. And I, I'm wondering, we didn't really talk about automation, but automation might take some jobs, mm. but um, uh, maybe not be uh, because we see aging populations. Um, will AI maybe um, be the solution for aging um, uh, societies? Mm. Because we see already in Japan and China that they um, they try to because they can't fill the jobs anymore, because there are not enough people, they, they use AI, they use robots. Is that maybe the solution for the biggest problem or still a threat? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I don't think that declining population is, is a problem in and of itself. You know, a thousand years ago, the entire planet contained less than 10 million people. Now we are close to 8 billion. If we stay at 8 billion, or if we go down to 4 billion, that's perfectly okay. But how does that it work actually, in an economy that has to grow? That, yeah. The, the problem is the transition. So, but, but first of all, we need to come to terms with the idea that uh, decreasing population is not a, a sign of malady. It's not a sign of disease in, in the body politic. Or, it's actually a good thing. It will be easier for the planet if there are a few, fewer humans. Again, I'm not going saying let's go back to 10 million. But five billion, pff, that's perfectly okay. Mm -hmm. The question is how to manage the transition with aging populations. And here, you know, some combination of uh, uh, relying more on AI and robots, relying to a certain extent on immigrants, and relying to a certain extent on outsourcing things can uh, uh, make the transition not just possible, but much more, much more smooth and, and much, much easier. Um, the key thing with automation is the question of retraining. Mm. I don't think that all the jobs will disappear. Some jobs disappear, but new jobs will emerge. And the big problem will be how to retrain people to fill the new jobs. Otherwise, what you get is huge unemployment of people who lost their old jobs combined with a lack of uh, workers for the new jobs. Like you get the, the worst of both worlds. And it's a big problem because, you know, in the past, you didn't need to retrain the population again and again. People acquired the profession in their younger years. Mm. And most people worked their entire life in the profession with the skills that they acquired in their, in their, in their youth. So is flexibility is the most important uh, skill for the future? Absolutely. Like the, the, the key for the future economy, for the future job market is, is flexibility. Mm. The ability to kind of retrain, relearn, reinvent every five or ten years, which creates immense financial burdens, but also immense psychological burdens. And those who will be able to solve this problem, they will lead the future economy. Mm. You meditate for two hours every day. I was wondering... How do you do that? How, how can you organize that? Or do you just employ so many people that they can do all the rest? Uh, first, I, I, we do employ a couple of people. So like, I, I don't get a lot of emails or so that I have to go over or things like that. But it's, it's kind of the, the first thing I put in my timetable is the time for meditation, both like every day and also during the year, I try to go every year to a long meditation retreat. So like uh, next month, I'm going for two months for meditation retreat. Um, I, I know it's a privilege. Most people are not in a position uh, in family-wise or in terms of their career uh, that they can do that. But it is important, I think, for everybody to disconnect uh, at least for a, for a few minutes every day, for a few hours every week, and to uh, invest, you know, in the health of their mind. Meditation, in the end, is about the health of the mind. We invest so much in the health of the body, like what we eat and exercises and things like that. And we invest so much in the health of our bank account. We should also invest something in the health of our mind, which ultimately is the one calling the shots about, mm. about all of this. 
some some people here in the room I know um, they were struggling to meditate because they say, oh, I can't concentrate for more than 10 seconds. Maybe um, you can you can mm. give um, a little um, insight good. on what meditation does. Is that um, for you? Is it also a little escapism because you are dealing with so many mm. threats and difficult topics during the day? No, I, I see it as, as the opposite of escapism, as confronting reality as it is. Uh, we run away from the reality. This is why it's so difficult to concentrate. Like you try to concentrate on your, on your breath and you can't do it for more than 10 seconds. The mind runs away to some fantasy. And it's not a bad thing because meditation is not about achieving some peaceful state. For me, meditation is about learning the truth about ourselves and about the world. And one of the very important truths to learn is that we know very little about our mind and we have very little control over it. You think you're in control. You think you're the CEO of your mind. You are not. You tell your mind, focus here on the breath. Five seconds, it runs away. So you have very, you, realizing how little we know and control our own minds is a very important thing. It's not a failure of meditation. It's a success of meditation. And, you know, it's not a theoretical idea that you read it in a book. If you try to sit, say, for one hour, constantly trying to focus on the breath, and constantly the mind runs away, after this one hour, you will understand something very important about who you really are and who is really mm. in charge. And the other thing, you realize that the mind constantly runs away from reality. What could be more real than the breath going in and out of your nostrils. You know, if it stops for, 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 for a minute, you die. And yet, you can't focus on this reality because you run away to all these dreams and fantasies and whatever. If we don't have the ability to observe the reality of our own breath without running away to some fantasy, how do we expect to be able to observe the reality of the global economic system or of climate change without running away to some comforting illusion or fantasy. What was your story with meditation? Did you, because it's, it's not that somebody just starts to meditate for two hours uh, just immediately. So when did you hmm. start? When did you, what happened? Um, I was doing my PhD at Oxford uh, in history, and I was not very satisfied <laughs> with my life. And a friend kind of nagged me for a year, go try meditation, go try meditation. And when everything else failed, I said, okay, what can I lose? I, I went and, and, and tried this, this meditation and it literally blew my mind. I mean, like just this realization of the first day sitting there trying to observe my breath and noticing for the first time in my life how little control I have over my mind And I, I, I don't understand what's happening there. Where is it all coming from? Um, so I, I came out of, of this course. It's a 10 days course. It's, it's, I suppose it was the most difficult thing I've ever done. It was really, really difficult, these 10 days. But I came out with the realization that I must get a better understanding of, of, of who I am, of this kind of immediate reality that, you know, I mean, I've, I've lived for 24 years and didn't even know the, most, the, the first thing about myself. So after, after that, I kind of set out this time, whatever else I do in life, this gets priority. Hmm. Is that also because uh, the, the, why you don't have a smartphone to keep focus or you don't want to give your data to Google? I, I'm, not, I'm, I, I'm not naive. I know that I can be followed even if I don't have a smartphone. Mm -hmm. Um, so, no, the, the main point is, is to keep away distractions because I know how difficult it is to, to, to control the mind and to remain focused. And I know that the people on the other side of the smartphone, you know, what the smartest people in the world have been doing in the last 20 years is learning how to hack the human brain uh, through the smartphone. And I know that I'm no match for them. If, if you put me against them, they will win. So my way of avoiding it is not to give them the screen, not to give them the, the direct access to my brain. Now, again, it's a privilege, I know. For most people, it's not an option. 
uh, in many jobs, in, 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 in schools, it's now a requirement. You must have a smartphone. And also, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit of a trick because my husband is carrying the smartphone. So, you know, if, if somebody really needs to reach me, then they, they call my husband. So it's not fair to him, but uh, life is not fair. You were, <laughs> we, we would have so many more questions, but we only have time for a last one. And mm. for that, I would like to look into the future. We have talked a lot about um, climate crisis, about all the other uh, threats we are facing today. In what kind of world do you think you will live personally, you and your partner, in, mm. let's say, 20 years? How, how will that look like then? I've, I don't know. And, and that's the key thing. It's the first time in history that people look to the 20 years to the future, they have no idea what the reality would look like. Now, of course, people could never predict, you know, political events, wars, revolutions. This can always happen. We can't predict. But throughout most of history, people knew what the job market would look like in 20 years. People knew what family structure would be like in 20 years. People knew what the human body would be like in 20 years. Now I look to the future and I honestly tell you, I, I can give you dif different scenarios. Maybe this will happen, maybe this will happen, but I have no certainty, which is another reason why I invest a lot of effort in meditation, because the one thing I know that I will need is mental flexibility, is the ability to kind of look reality in the eye. This is what is happening right now and adapt to it, adjust to it. Uh, so the one thing I know for certain about the world of 20 years from now, it will be very different from this world, and it will be extremely hectic and fluid. It already is. Mental flexibility, this is um, the key word um, we keep for now. Thank you so much. I really hope we don't um, only speak in 20 years again to see what really happened <laughs> and that we speak before. Um, thank you so much again for being here. Thank you. Und das war mein Gespräch mit Yuval Noah Harari. Es war ein Live-Podcast, den wir beim Gigagipfel in Sölden für Sie aufgezeichnet haben. Wenn Sie Feedback zu dem Gespräch haben, freue ich mich wie immer über Kommentare in der Handelsblatt des Rub LinkedIn-Gruppe oder senden Sie mir eine Mail. Die Details finden Sie in den Shownotes. Danke an dieser Stelle auch für die Unterstützung von Florian Högerle und Regina Körner und Migo Fecke von professionalpodcast.com, dem Dienstleister für Strategieberatung und Podcastproduktion. Wir melden uns dann nächste Woche Freitag wieder. Bis dahin wünsche ich Ihnen eine schöne Woche und interessante digitale, aber natürlich auch analoge Zeiten. Ihr Sebastian Mattes. Musik